morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of A Resource Life. Today is actually a really big episode. So thank you, Shaney, for bringing up this topic. Um, it actually overlaps a lot of things. So um, I think every single person that sells on eBay should have the exact same goal. Okay, so this is the goal. The goal is to find less items, but better items. This is the exact same strategy for how you find replenishables. So people always ask, um, how do I find more replenishables? How do I find, you know, essentially, I want to list less or I want to spend less time reselling. Well, all of that is related to the same thing. You have to get better at one thing, and but you don't know what that one thing is in the beginning. So you need to adjust and go for it. You don't need to do more than one thing. You know, Michael Phelps spent more time in the water than on land. He did, he literally did nothing else but swim for 10 years. And that, that's fine. He ended up being the best athlete ever. So you can just do one thing. It's totally okay. You don't need to be multi-passionate. There's no reason to do that unless if that is your goal to sell as many random things as possible, then what you actually need is time. You need to have unlimited money in the bank and all you have to do is you're just treasure hunting for fun then what you can do is buy a pirate ship and go search for lost treasures okay if that's your true goals looking for amazing treasures the world has never seen before okay then maximize for that but i think what you a lot of people are doing is they start with finding things around the house garage sales thrift stores that's fine everyone starts there then you just start narrowing down what you sell and less but better. Hey, is this item that I'm going to sell? Is that better than what I'm currently selling? If not, don't sell that item. Move on to the next one. You'll start narrowing down exactly what you want. So everyone should have the exact same goal. I don't think anyone has ever told me I'd like to sell more items and make less money. Has anybody said that? No. Everybody wants one item that sells a thousand a times. Thousand and they don't have to um, look anymore. They can just set it and forget it. And the way to do that is to just narrow it down. When you get really, really, really narrow, this is what happens. You find out who supplies that item. That's what happens. No, I've never heard anyone say, all I do is sell scissors, but I have no idea where they come from. I bet in one day you could find out where every single pair of scissors is made. I bet there's a fact there's four factories in China that make every single pair of scissors in the world. I bet you could find that out in one day if you just focus and that's all you did. You just threw your phone into the ocean, got on your computer and tried to figure out where scissors come from. You could find out in one day, all the distributors locally. Usually when you go buy a pair right on the box, it'll say where it comes from. So replenishables should very straightforward. Just narrow it down. So what we're going to do is talk about strategies to do that. So um, I have to be a little bit careful here because I don't want to um, offend people with what I'm going to call this. I'm going to call the pile of random items that you just picked up because they're cheap your shame pile. Okay. So even for myself. So now I have a little bucket of shame. Every single day I have all this stuff that I don't want to throw away because I have money invested into it. I'm going to do a little bit of shame pile every day, okay? Around 10 to 15 items. That's random stuff that's not related to it. That's the stuff that's not less but better. It's just more but worse. Random things you picked up, okay? It's your shame pile. And there's nothing to be ashamed of if you actually approach it and get it knocked out, okay? Just in the future, when like people always say, oh, I'm, I'm not going to buy anything this week. If you're a reseller, why would you do that? You're supposed to buy stuff every single week. You need stuff to resell. Just stop buying the wrong stuff. Stop buying random things. Stop trying new categories that are not better. So this is what this call should be about. So I think 15 items a day of items. This is like the maximum shame you should do in a day. Okay, focus on the goal of getting really good at a couple of categories then you're, most of us have a shame pile. Get on that 15 items a day. I have a little orange rolly cart. I'm going to put the shame into there, roll it into my area, get those items listed one by one using my phone because there's no efficiency when every single item is random. 
You got to do it one by one. So I'll just manually list it with my phone at a price that it will sell. And that's what I want people to do. List it at a price that will sell. Why would you store items that you don't want to sell in the first place? Get rid of that. Even for 99 cents plus shipping, that'll teach you a lesson to not buy stuff that's that's bad. And if it's worth a lot of money, you won't list it for 99 cents. So that's how you narrow down to get into replenishables. You can't, I'm, it's really rare that people accidentally find one. Oh, I, I accidentally became really good at selling fleece. It's never happened. You have to focus. No one accidentally becomes a millionaire. You have to focus. So the strategy is daily approach your shame pile and then work on improving your similar or replenishable items. That's what you should do every day. That's your plan. Don't let your shame pile get in the way of you working on what's more important. Because what you could do, you could just put, you could go rent a U-Haul truck, put every single item that's not rela related to your, your niche and donate the entire truck. And you would make your money back in just probably two or three months just being able to focus on one niche. Your income level would quadruple. You know, when you go apply for a job, sorry, I'm on a rant this morning. When you go apply for a job, they don't say, what other full-time jobs are you working? They don't, because you're not supposed to do more than one full-time job. You just work there. In fact, you can get fired for having a side hustle. At some companies, you can get fired for having a side hustle. They don't want you to have one. Like at Amazon, if you're working for Jeff Bezos, you don't get to have work-life balance. That's not a thing at Amazon. They don't have that. You, your, your goal is creating the biggest marketplace in the world. They're very upfront about that. I have a friend, she's a lawyer. She moved up to Seattle. That was the last time I talked to her. That's it. She now, her whole life is Amazon. So you've got to decide, what do you want to do? So in this chat, I want everyone to think about, this is the goal. Um, how many items do you want to do a day that are not related to your goal? And then just do that until your, your pile is gone. So for some people, for me, it's 15. It shouldn't take that long. I, I boxed it up yesterday. I have 16 boxes of shame. Okay. 16 giant boxes of shame. I packed them all up. They're in the corner of my, my, um, storage unit. I'm going to do them one by one, 15 items at a time. Also, if you have a lot of shame like I do and you look at all of it, you're going to end up doing nothing. Okay. So if your whole house is a death pile, clear out one corner, face the corner and just start listing that death pile. Pretty straightforward. That's the plan. Work on one niche and with the time you have left, approach your shame pile. You don't have to stop shopping. There's nothing wrong with shopping. It's just the buying the stuff that's not related. That would be like telling a professional athlete to, to stop working out. You just got to stop doing the workouts that cause injury. Stop doing the workouts that are not related. You know, it's a shame when you listen to um, professional athletes that get injured during pickup games. Like what a waste. Somebody that's worth a you know, million dollars a game is now they play pickup basketball with their friends and get injured. What is that is so stupid. So everyone focus, stop getting injured. And if you just compound your money, it doesn't take very long to become wealthy. The problem is you diversify into things where you lose money or time. Worse is losing time. So you might think, oh, I am picking up this item for a dollar that I'm going to sell for 50. You actually lost money because you've got to go home, research it. You didn't, you didn't make more money. Now, I will give you one exception to this rule, which is uh, Paul in the group was talking about making the best of um, flea markets, thrift stores, um, whatever in the beginning. Th that is a really, really high hourly. That is what you should do in the beginning. Over time, though, you start narrowing down and start picking up less things. So I would recommend if you're an electronics seller, don't go to one garage sale and pick up electronics and clothing and all this other stuff. Don't do that. If you're an electronics seller over time, go to 10 garage sales and only buy electronics over time. In the beginning, maybe go to one garage sale and you don't know what your niche is. So just buy whatever random stuff is, but just keep in mind, that's going to become a shame pile in the future. There are people who start right from the beginning in one niche. 
You do not have to bounce around. And, you know, all of the niches are already known at this point. There's no secret niches. There's no secret things. And the more speculative it is, the shorter it's going to last. If you see people posting it on Instagram, that's probably a good sign that that niche is done. Don't waste your time on that. There's something you're buying for a dollar and it sells for 500. I'm pretty sure in two weeks, it's not going to sell for 500 anymore and it's not going to cost a dollar. It's going to even out to the point where the best things to sell in the world, the margin is really low. I think the markup on Rolex watches is 10%. There's no room to resell a brand new Rolex watch. It's, if it sells for 10,000, they're buying it for nine. There's no room there. It's completely mature versus a brand new watch no one has ever heard of. Maybe those are selling for 500 and they only cost a dollar because no one's ever heard of them yet. But once word gets out, that same watch will cost $400 to buy and resell. A, a good example of that would, would be um, CC Phil's or Filson. Filson is like the top clothing brand, I think, to sell on eBay. There's, there's so much demand and so little supply. That's one of those markets that you're never going to find it for a dollar. I mean, I guess you could if you were thrifting, but it's just the longer markets mature, the less margin they are, but the safer they are, in my opinion. So, Shaney, thank you for bringing up this topic. I'm going to not hire Shaney, but maybe I'll hire Shaney to help me come up with topics every day because this has been really useful thinking about something specific for each conversation. Like today, I was thinking about how do you attack, I'm going to call it a shame pile because people don't talk about things they're ashamed of right? And they treat it differently. So how's your business doing? Oh, it's great. You post what's, what's selling. You don't post the 80 items that are not listed in the corner. You don't talk about that. We're going to talk about that today. So let's go with Shaney first. Shaney, um, talk, let's talk about your day and then how you're going to start getting, how you're going to start focusing. So I'm wondering about using that strategy, but maybe selling lots. That way you could get rid of some of it quicker. That's a good idea. Yeah. I like it. I like the shame pile. That's pretty good. Or maybe there's just, like you said, just go donate it. Just go donate it and, and free your mind. You can. You can definitely free your mind. You can set yourself free by just doing it. Or and the third, um, Or the third thing is, is in this group, say you say somebody has something, they're like, you know what? I'm not doing jeans anymore. And maybe Matt wants them. That's right. I've been doing that with jewelry with Linda, just sending it all over. So that's a good thing. One more thing I want to mention. Sorry, I'm on a rant this morning. The 80% um, of what you do in life is based on your own personal experiences. So for example, I'm not one of these people, but I know people who get more joy from saving money than spending money. If that is your personal experience, if you personally feel better saving and investing money versus spending money, retail therapy, you, if you feel nice after you go shopping, that's probably a bad sign as a reseller that that therapeuticness from it should come, should be the, you kind of have to shock yourself into the reverse, which is like, you get the joy and satisfaction from listing, from having a clean workspace, from having nothing in your kitchen, from having a clean workspace. If, if you get the joy from that, you're probably going to be a successful reseller because you don't want a pile of stuff that's unlisted. You want clean areas to work in. You want a clean time where you actually get off of work. And I have been sleeping so much better now that I sell in less categories. I can't believe that it actually affected my sleep and my blood pressure, everything. It's, it's easier. Uh, Christine? I have something to say about um, people who shop too much. Um, and you, somebody in Travis said, you know, it's an addiction with the, um, with the electronics. Sometimes when a lot of resellers have this problem with addiction, shopping yep. addictions. Definitely. And really, you know, just so that people out there can understand where they are, are they just like on an accelerated a habit or are they in addiction? When they're in addiction, it's a matter of how much they're excited when they're selling. Mm. After they leave and make the purchase and it's at home, 
then there's a dip in the emotion. That's right. And the shame comes in. And that's the part where people need to take a note of if they're in trouble, you know, with addiction on this thing. Because a lot of people get into trouble, you know, when they try they go in, they think, oh, I'm a great shopper, and then they're then they've lost everything. So just a just a side note for people out there that buy too much and are in trouble emotionally or in um, intellectually. Yeah, I was just talking to tech about this and it's it's kind of a consumer mindset. If you're addicted to consuming, you're in trouble because like everything is related to that overeating, overspending, uh, it, it, you know, you just spend, eat, consume. And it's, uh, you know, that cycle, you got to reverse it to produce. That's why, you know, everyone's on social media. That's why I think you should adopt the strategy of post and ghost. Post something yeah, yeah. useful for the community, then leave. Um, that's if you're addicted to posting useful information, you won't attract anybody who is the opposite. So since I have been trying to post like really important information, my views have gone way down, but everything that I've done has made way more money. My YouTube channel makes more money, even though there's less people watching it because it's just higher quality people. This is the same thing as the less, but better everything for everyone it's easy to say no. Okay, this is um, Tech and I are going to talk about this on the podcast tonight. It's easy to say no when you're living the perfect life. If, you, if, if your life is perfect, why would someone be like, hey, do you want to go do this? No, that's not better than what I'm doing now. Definitely not. Hey, do you want to go uh, jump off a bridge? Probably not. That's not better than what you're currently doing, right? Do you want to you know, stick your hand in the boiling water? That's easy to say no to because you don't want that. But if it's like, hey, do you want to go have dinner with a, fr with a friend that you kind of like? That's kind of hard to say no to if you haven't seen him in a long time. But then if you're just like me, I'm thinking, you know what? I don't have time for, for 100 mediocre relationships. Maybe I have time for four or five awesome ones. I have time. Everyone has time to, to do more than one niche, just not at the same time. You could you know, get really good at... Uh, Let's say, for example, you're selling lots. That's probably one of the top categories, lots, because so many people want to resell, right? So you could um, learn how to sell lots because those are easy to sell on Facebook Marketplace because everyone's looking for extra money. If you like shopping, you could just put it in a box and say, look, this is an estimated profit of $1,000. It's $200 from me. Go for it. That will sell instantly. You could sell that box for 250 to 300 in seconds because people are trying to, to make a profit and they're trying to earn extra money. So exactly. Um, so also, all you need to do is have the habit of listing more than you buy. That's it. You don't, in fact, if you don't buy, it's the same thing as yo-yo dieting. I see people like, oh, I'm not going to buy anything this week. Then they, they, they hold up all this crazy emotion and on Sunday they buy a thousand things. What are, they, 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 that all that work throughout the week is now wasted. It's like being really good and eating salad all week and then on Saturday and Sunday you have 10 cheeseburgers. That's not how this works. Like you can't deprive yourself. That will result in horrible behavior. So anyway. How, every, how would ahead. the mindset work for someone? Okay, so I'm watching some of the... I've seen a lot of things, but the, these toy people that buy a certain toy and they're waiting for it to retire or waiting for it to not be a thing anymore. Okay. You know how, how does that work with that same model? Okay. A hundred percent works. So there's a few different people who do this. If you sell collectibles, you, you don't have to flip it right away. You could play the long-term game. You just think about where it will peak at. So as an example, most Nike shoes that are rare, they peak around three to five hundred dollars because what happens is supply dwindles, but the demand is about the same. People end up wearing the shoes. It's the same thing with wine. People buy wine. It gets drank over time. There's less and less bottles. People like it as nostalgic, but it won't go up to a million dollars per bottle of wine. Most wine doesn't go that high. Some does, but the majority of wine will probably cap out at like 40 to 80 dollars a bottle once it's rare and people like it. So depending on the category, if you sell, for example, discontinued cosmetics, a lot of people will buy that, including that lady thrift to sell on Instagram. There's a, 
there's still a limit. You can't sell lip balm for $5,000. It's above the value of it. But would somebody pay $50 for their favorite lip balm that's sold out? Probably. So it depends on your the future value of it. But it's actually a very, very poor long-term investment. So Genie is calling it your 401k closet. It's not true. Your, 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 um, a 401k is much better because it compounds over time. You should not buy things that is an investment. You should buy things to flip. I don't like, if you think about like, even, I don't know, I was thinking like, as an example, if, if, um, I buy some Pokemon stuff and I buy for a hundred dollars and I wait to, and I give it to my daughter when she's 18, right? Maybe this Pokemon set's worth 500, but that's not a lot of return for 18 years. So if you think about the, the, it's, it's better to buy things to flip. In my opinion, you can double and triple your money every couple of months versus waiting a long term. You should not call it your 401k closet, in my opinion. Maybe because Genie says it's Legos. Legos have appreciated more than the stock, the stock market. Maybe, but I would still rather you put your money in an index fund than, than that because you still need to do the work. At least the stock market, if you don't sell your stock, you don't have to pay any, any taxes or space. Um, I just think it's, I used to think of reselling as investing. It's not, I don't think it is. A lot of items also depreciate over time. They become less valuable. So not all Lego sets appreciate. So yeah, Nick is saying you might get stuck with a stack of Beanie Babies. That's possible. You know, you don't know what's going to go up and what's going to go down. So I don't think reselling is a good place to park your assets. That's why I'm going to call it a shame pile and not, I'm not going to call it a future profit pile. That's not what it is. It should just be listed. Um, let's see. Okay. This is a, a good thing. Nick is saying niching down. You feel like you're losing on, on opportunities, but it's actually the opposite. You're limiting your opportunities when you sell in too many niches because you don't have enough time. You know, you can't like, you know, I'm about to um, have my first baby. And I remember growing up, I wanted to do a bunch of different things. And, and it didn't because I heard the advice, you can be anything you want. That was the advice I got as a kid. But if I had gotten the advice, you can only do a few things. You can do it only a few things. I would have been a lot different. Not, I mean, in theory, I'd have been different as a kid thinking about, oh, wow, I only can do a couple of things in my life. But I've, I've met young people who know that. I've met young people who say, I, I can't do everything. And so they've learned that at a young age somehow that they can only do a few things. Um, so here's an example. I think this is, I think Lego is a wonderful example. The people who flip Lego for, um, I've never met a person that flips Lego that makes over a hundred thousand a year. That's still good though. If you were just in the niche of flipping Lego, you would be online looking at all auctions. You would go on the, shopgoodwill.org, you would look at every single Lego opportunity and you can make a hundred K no problem. The problem is you can't replicate looking for it. You have to get really good at looking for it and watching the auctions and knowing what all this stuff is worth. It's hard to outsource. If you sell common items though, you can make a million dollars a year or $5 million a year, just selling regular common stuff. So it's, it just goes to, how so, much time are you striking out? Go ahead. So I'm wondering if maybe there's a list of the, so you're saying like, let's use Lego for example. Oh yeah, that's probably not possible. But in this, this, and this category it is. So clothing obviously, cause that's, we talk about that a lot. What are some other things that you're saying that it is possible? Just, I'm just curious. It's possible for, sorry. Can you repeat that? I'm, I'm just curious, like the categories. Okay. So you just said you probably can't make a hundred thousand with Lego. All right. You but, can, if that's all you do, but go ahead. Okay. And so tech does the clothing and we yeah. know how he does. So what are those types of categories? Because what you're saying is you can't, you have to be able to replicate, right? Like, yeah. okay. So, so let me, let me, let me back up because I guess 
I need to be really careful because you can make a million dollars a year selling Lego. You just have to have a replicatable system. So you would need to have a way that Legos regularly come to you. You regularly process Legos. It's just the treasure hunting model of you going to find awesome items doesn't usually result in, you need an inbound system. You need stuff coming to you. And it's really hard to have treasure come to you unless you're like a consignment shop. Consignment shops um, end up working well because they develop a reputation for stuff coming in. You need inbound inventory. But you know anyone can make 25 to 100 grand selling random stuff. You don't need the focus. You can just find the best stuff around you. That's why like Hustle at Home Mom is a new coach. And on Thursdays, she talks about making 100 grand reselling basically um, no, no niching down whatsoever. All she does is pick the 10 highest profit items at every garage sale. And she goes to 10 of those. And she has a listing habit that's that's starts at 9 p.m. because she has young kids. So she can't do it earlier than 9 p.m. So she has the listing habit. And then she snipes the best 10 items at 10 garage sales every week. That's like five to 15 listings a day. $20 plus profit an item. There's six figures right there. As, as, as a mom, one day of sourcing. But you would have to get really good at essentially sorting. How do you know which 10 items at the garage show are the most valuable? Just practice. You'd have to know. And then you'd have to have that listing habit of actually getting it up. You can't just buy it and store it. So that's just not scalable. If she misses a Saturday, her whole income's gone. You know, you have... Versus if you have inbound inventory, your business makes money when you sleep because other people are looking for it for you. It's really hard to get inbound treasure. You have to go manually get it. Uh, I do like the treasure hunting sourcing model. It just It's just very limiting it, it, to a degree. Because, okay, this is why it's limiting in my opinion. When you take a vacation, your business takes a vacation. That's really hard. It's almost like when you have a job, at least they give you two weeks of paid vacation. I think that's law. Is that law? I think you have to provide two weeks vacation. Um, Ed, do you have a question? Yeah, I think the treasure hunting model is okay as long as you know that that's what you're doing and what the limitations of it are. That's right. Yeah, I think that that's, that's a good point to make. The limitations are just essentially you have to work forever if you're a treasure hunter. There's no break from it. Also, the treasure hunting random model falls under the same listing every day concept. You know, versus if you focus on a niche, eventually items will come to you. So Halim is asking, how do you get profitable clothing sent to you? What you need to do is become known as a buyer. That's it. You reach out to to people who have clothing and let them know that you're a serious buyer and then clothing will come to you. I can't even handle now the amount of clothing deals that I'm getting. So I don't, I don't even know how to hand, I don't know what to do with it. Like I was talking to Harry Tornado yesterday. He sells like 50% of his stuff to his YouTube audience. And I'm like, how do you do that? How do you sell stuff to your audience? And now I know how. I, I might sell more items in a day than he does in a month because of how time consuming that is to sell to your audience. You've got to first make a video and talk about the item. Then someone's got to reach out to you. You've got to get their information. Then you have to, that that's like 10 to 20 minutes per item. You know, the, 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 one, the one amazingly interesting thing about that is how fast it is. You can sell an item in seconds instead of I'm expecting to sell an item in five to six months. It's so different looking at the, the different models. Um, and replenishables come naturally when you niche down because, okay, Halima is saying, how do I get profitable clothing come to me to come to me? That's step one. Then you start saying, you know what? Um, what's selling really well for me is the brand cool K U H L. So um, I only want to sell cool. So then you start reaching out to all these companies and saying, okay, I'll buy all your cool for this price. And you have a replenishable, you know, the market 
uh, of a new pair of cool pants is $42. So you can buy any pair that's $26 or, or, or less because you know as soon as you put it in your store, it's going to sell for $42.99. So you're not worried about the price part. Then um, over time, you start to figure out, okay, I don't want to look for supplies. I want to get my supply directly from Cool. So you go to Cool's website and you figure out how to do it. And they're like, okay, you need to have a, a brick and mortar store with at least 200 people walking by per day. And then we'll sell it to you wholesale. So then you figure out what it costs to open that brick and mortar and you do it. That's how you could get. Everyone that has a brick and mortar has replenishables that come to them. That's how you would do it long term. You could just call a supplier and they would sell to you directly wholesale if you had a brick and mortar. But nobody, people are, are kind of too lazy to do that. But that's like the way. And the average person that owns a brick and mortar is 50 years old. So they're not, it takes time to build up enough savings to buy one. It's like pretty expensive. Um, so yeah, Shani, I would agree with this. The, ability, the discipline to be able to walk away from things comes from... I guess it comes from how much time you think you have. So the average life expectancy is 73 and I'm 36. So I'm halfway. And I would like the second half of my life to be better than the first half of my life. So this urgency makes it easy for me to say no. Cause it's like, no, I don't have time for that. No, I don't have time for that. It's easier as you have less time. So it is really weird how, Having less time, like I would say that most of the resellers that I know that make six figures or and above have a job. The people who have a job make six figures reselling. How interesting is that? People who have families, those are the people who have seven figure businesses sometimes because their time is of such a high value. They don't put up with any BS. They just go for it. I was telling tech that um, my grandparents did fairly well in my opinion. My, my grandparents could not read, but they were able to get a job, raise kids, own a home, completely fine. My wife's grandparents, the same. Grew up really poor. They were fine. They were still able to buy a home and raise their kids. But our parents didn't do as well as our grandparents, which you would think doesn't, well, how did that happen? But essentially, our grandparents didn't want our my grandparents didn't want my parents to work as hard. So they had all these different priorities and they just weren't, they struggled. So it's like a, every other generation is successful almost, you know, I don't know. It's a weird thought that I've been having because like, that's why I was saying I'm going to have my daughter dig ditches so that she can understand that is the alternative. Just so they appreciate it. Um, Halima is saying there's a local ladies consignment shop that gets more clothing than they can put in the shop. Should you approach her to see if you can strike a deal? Yeah. So th that's, so th this is a great question. What do I have to buy it for to make a profit? That is your responsibility to figure out. No one can tell you that you have to know what every single item is. And that's why eBay is so hard because if I were to say, okay, Halim, your job is to figure out what these 80 categories, the best price to buy that you couldn't do it. You'd have to narrow it down just one or two categories, actually, probably just one. This is wow. Let's listen to this quote from Nick. Hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men. And weak men create hard times. That's from Michael, Michael Hopp. That's, that's pretty intense. But yeah, I would agree with that. Who works really hard and builds up an empire and then they want their kids to do the same? Not really. In, in Singapore, in college, there's like a saying that's like, um, my parents were entrepreneurs, so I don't have to be. You know, isn't that weird? And like the United States entrepreneurship is glorified there. It's considered low class 
because you have to just grind. It's considered the bottom of the the bottom of the social bracket is somebody that has to grind and start their own business. When you've made it, you can now th- you know use your brain to help the community or think about a softer skill than just earning money. Um, let's see what pe- questions people have online. Um, a buy and hold strategy is an investment. There we go. I like that thought from Sean. So. That's why I don't know if, if a Lego is a good buy and hold because typically you, you want to sell Legos to get your money out of it. Um, please talk about feedback and how to increase it as a new seller. Feedback doesn't matter. So it's a waste of time. Don't spend time on feedback. As long as you have a few positive feedback, you'll be fine. Maybe over 100 feedback matters so you don't look completely new. And you can do that in one day by just buying a hundred one dollar items and getting feedback from the buyer. So for a hundred bucks, you can get a hundred feedback. Just go online, buy um, sporting cards or rest. I bought recipes when I first started. I bought a spaghetti recipe for thirty seven cents. They emailed it to me. There's one feedback. Um, also, you could just sell a whole bunch of stuff and and get the feedback that way too. Um, let's see. You find that when you go to garage sales for a few things and then list, okay, this is a good strategy from, from Martha. Um, there's a lot of people that have a one day reselling habit on Saturday. They go find stuff in the morning and they list the same day. I love that. It's compartmentalized. You can have the rest of your week to do whatever you want. Um, versus she says, when she goes to the, the, uh, bins, it's a mini death pile that, that starts to form. I think that that's true because, at the binge, you're already there. I would say, I don't, I wonder if, let me think here. If my job was at the bins, it's almost like, like if I, if I went with Travis and I decide, cause I don't like doing things by myself. So Travis and I went to the bins every morning. I'm at the end. I might be like, you know what, Travis, you look at my pile, I'll look at your pile. And then we'll make two piles of what we think is a questionable buy. If you did that for each other every day, I bet you would leave a third of it there. You wouldn't take it home if somebody else looked at it. But because you're there and it's so cheap, you end up just buying it. Like, like an, a great example for me would be like J. Crew. J. Crew sells all day on eBay, but not for not for very much. So it's easy to pick it up for fifty cents or a quarter or a dollar, even two dollars, even eight dollars for a jacket because you know it's gonna sell. But if you're at the bins, you can find something better if you just look for another half an hour. Um, Ed, do you have some more feedback? Nope. Okay. Um, Let's see. Do I pay for clothes um, by weight? I do. It's about $240 a pound where I live. So I don't know what that translation into Canadian dollars is. A little bit less. Um, Miguel is drop shipping items on Facebook. He has the choice to list one item of clothing in all sizes. So, okay. I don't think it's too sketchy. I just saw something on Facebook marketplace, um, for gloves. I think we were talking about gloves on this call. So Facebook was spying on me and they presented clubs. I mean, gloves to me on my, my, my news feed. Um, and it said that the, the estimated delivery date was March 1st. So clearly a drop shipper. So as long as you are clear about when the item will be delivered, I don't think it's sketchy. But if you say they're going to arrive next week, but they don't ship until March 1st, you're going to get banned. So just be, if you're going to drop ship, just be clear. Um, let's see. What do you do when you have the only item on eBay? How do you determine price? Do you wait or cave in and lower it? Depends on your model. So um, a good example that eBay gave me was if you're selling watch links um, and you're the only person selling a watch link for, let's say, an Omega Speedmaster, the, the watch link, let's say, is $1,000 and you have one of the links. And so somebody would need that if they needed to increase the wrist size on their watch so that they could use it. There's no reason. And I would say the market price on it is probably $100. There's no reason to discount that to $20 because you still have to wait for somebody that needs that 
there's only one buyer out of every maybe 2000 views that may actually need that link. So there's no reason to lower your price. But if there's a million other people selling it, if you're selling, this is another example. Let's say if you're selling a old Navy t-shirt, right? And it's rare. No one has ever seen that t-shirt. Still need to sell for two bucks. Even though it's super rare because there's so many other items that are exactly like it. It doesn't, I don't know if you could sell a super rare old Navy shirt because just because there's only one of it doesn't mean that there's a market for it. Um, let's see. Are there any products made in the USA? Yes, you can go to thomas.net. It's a, it's a, it's a, manufacture a list of all us or North American made products. So then you don't have to deal with the supply chain from China or the, or, or Asia. Um, yeah, I would agree with this. Buddha is saying that, um, the definition of wealth right now is time. I, I agree with that. And that's what Charlie Munger said, Warren Buffett's business partner. He wasn't really after the money. He was after the independence. There is no greater currency than being able to do whatever you want, whenever you want, with whoever you want. That that's the that's the best thing ever. So buy time with your money. Um, so Forenzo said he was having great sales until he got COVID. That is a that is one of the reasons why um, I had one of my workers sneezed and I had her go get tested. <laughs> She, didn't, she did not have COVID, but amazingly here, you can get overnight results for free. I don't know where, I mean, uh, you, you can go get tested, walk in here, and then the next day you'll know if you have it or not here. So I don't know what your states are like, but I can't afford to get sick. I really don't want to get sick. It's like a huge kick in the, in, yeah, I don't want to get sick. So um, Buddha is saying how to source Lego 24-7. Super easy. Um, go to all the major sites, eBay, Shop Goodwill, Amazon, um, all the local spots. Go everywhere that Legos are sold and then just refresh all those sites all day. Um, let's see. Yeah, I would say that I think that's all the questions I have in the chat. How long do I see eBay running as a marketplace forever? I don't see it going away ever. It was first to market. How long do you think Coca-Cola will keep selling as a soda? Probably longer than we'll be alive. Most likely. The first to market is almost always there. That's one of the rules in, in, uh, in, in business, I think, for these types of things. As far as e-commerce goes, I don't think eBay or Amazon are going away ever. Um psychologically strategies for the shame pile. Yeah. So I think in general, people don't talk about things that they're ashamed of. So, you know, maybe we should call it something different. Maybe call it your, you know, that is so weird. There's also shame bragging right now, which is weird. Like I'll see on Instagram, I didn't do anything today. And you know what? That's okay. I, I don't know what the, and then it'll get a million likes. Me too. I didn't do anything either. So I don't know what if that's like a, um, you know, so I don't know. You could also say that it's awesome because a lot of people will relate to you. If you say, today was rough, so I just had a glass of wine and took a bath and I didn't do anything, you know. <laughs> uh, are you flipping? Thank you for the super chat. Um, so are you flipping is asking if the, if the items that I pick are sorted or just straight donations, I have never been able to pick straight donations. I don't even think I would want to because straight donations would include blankets, linen. I, I've looked at them before. They include blankets, linens, dirty diapers, mattresses. I mean, like I don't, I want it to be pre-sorted. I'm okay. If they take out the Gucci and Louis Vuitton before I get there. So. Oh, so Bill is asking, what sell-through rate on an item am I looking for before I buy? Personally, um, six months. I'm okay if an item sells within six months. Um, 
I do it for my children asks, do you, do I think eBay will start charging for sneakers over a hundred dollars? Probably not because they lost all of the market share and they need to get it back. At least I don't see that happening in 2021. I wanted to say something about that. Be make sure that it's in the athletic shoes category because I just yeah. sold a pair of two hundred and fifty dollars sneakers, and I assumed I wasn't getting charged anything. But because it was like a fashion brand, I would have just put it in the uh, athletic, but it automatically put me in the casual shoes. So I lost like thirty five dollars in fees. That's a great um, tip. Make sure you guys put it in the right category. Um, or Mick, Hey, if you guys are in the over a hundred dollar category, they're starting to do authentication. So it might be a good market for you to get into. Uh, well, that's, that's, can we talk to, um, Bill, are you available to chat? Let's see. He might be gone. Um, but maybe let's talk to Josh. Cause I don't see Josh too often. Josh, what can you do to narrow down the things that you sell? Um, so you mean like niche down? Yeah. So less item, less, but better. Okay. So one thing that I have done and it, it helps me is to, I've been, I still pay for it monthly, but I've stayed away from the discord group because that like there's great deals on there, but not every time it's something you're familiar with. So then first you got to try and check out and buy it. And then you got to see what it sells for and do all the research. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a firm believer that like stick with what you're good at and master it before you move on to a new niche or a new category. And I still got mastering to do. I like that. Yeah. When you count all the time it takes to research it, if it's going to be profitable or not, sometimes you've lost money. Yeah. So, yeah, like I feel like it's I, I liked what you said earlier. It's important and it's good that a new person starts out with one niche like 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 uh, Jordans or, or tennis shoes or something like that. And they're going to get good at that. They're going to improve on that and they're going to start learning used comps without even looking it up, new comps without even looking it up at times. Um, That's right. That's huge. And it, it might it might take a few months, but then once you master that, you master shoes, you could make money on shoes all day, garage sales, goodwill, whatever. And then maybe you could get into sandals or, or a niche that's not completely different but like similar maybe maybe cowboy boots or something like that this is a great question from nick which is um what would your recommendation to be to find that niche that you may want to work in so i actually don't like um people picking what they're passionate about so the 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 one exception to this rule might be sneakers because sneakers are really interesting. So a lot of people love them and they also make their living from it. But like it would be make it would make more sense to pick a category that's hot. So, for example, I hear people say the only way to make it work is to find your passion. And I'm like, bro, you are in a market that's profitable. If you are passionate about lavender, that would be really hard to make a full-time living on eBay. It doesn't have a good, it doesn't have a strong value on eBay because lavender is really cheap local. You can't flip it with the cost of shipping online. It's too hard. So you, I would say pick a market that's actually profitable, not one that's based on your passion. Or if you get super lucky, you can have it overlap. But it's also better if you don't smoke your own supply, in my, in my opinion. If you end up collecting what you really like, like if you're an audiophile, how can you sell something that's awesome? You just be like, you know, what? I'll just keep it for a while. Then you end up having an amazing collection, but you're not a very good reseller. So. Yeah, I agree with that. Except if you're passionate, like, like Daniel, the stuff he finds is so cool. Yeah. And 
so then I think you get really good at it and, and you, I don't know, there's something to be said about having a passion for the item that you're selling. I don't think so. I get that if you get stuck in it where it's like, Oh, wait, I don't want to sell this. It's so cool. Keep it. But, um, actually, well, let's, let's go with Daniel. Daniel, what are your thoughts? Um, honestly, uh, it's not as repeatable. Um, and it's not sustainable over long time. And it, it does get old because uh, you, you do hit home runs, but then like you'll you'll go into something you're not an expert at and then you'll like maybe break even or just not make enough profit to make it worth it. So I am transitioning like you're just hammering in, like niching down at like the clothing thing. So I'm really transitioning into that and trying to do a more uh, volume based models so the way that that's getting me motivated is finding a consistent spot that i'm gonna like i found a really good uh non-profit religious based store right by my storage unit which i started to go to almost every single day because they just they don't charge like savers or goodwill will just mark something up if it's a brand name it's like whatever type of clothing it is and since it's nonprofit, people are giving really high quality stuff. So that's the way I'm kind of uh, trying to niche down because I've been, you know, I can't spend a thousand dollars on everything just to make like five hundred dollars. I need to just, you know, I'm working with more limited funds now. And I like, have. I feel like I used to be Daniel, and I had some crazy home runs, but it's nowhere near as much money as I'm making volume. It's not even close. It's like I'm making 10 times as much money doing volume than I was selling one-offs because, because I struck out so much. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely striking out more because I feel like a lot more people are doing this now. And, uh, you know, like I, I, like I said, you know, the, we keep bringing up the Lego sets and I, you know, made thousands of dollars in four Lego sets, but I have my eye on this one now, which just came up yesterday. And I know, I mean, should I spend a thousand dollars to make $600? I probably am not going to do that. Yeah, that that's, that's a challenge. Ed? I think we talked about this earlier, but unless you're a robot, if you work within your passion, you're not going to be objective. That's usually true. You'll pay more for something you care about. You also sell, you also not take a deal just because you want to keep it. It's not like emotionless. That's usually true. Versus, and also you think about how replaceable items are. For me, I can accept a low offer because I, I can replace it. If you can't replace rare items, it's really hard. You got to get all the money because it's so hard to get it. Um, yeah, Sears is a good example of um, of a company that was really good at being a retail. But I think Sears, they like invented credit and they had all these other different companies and now they're gone. So it's easy to also get good at a category and then get cocky and try to do a whole bunch of other categories too. And that usually doesn't work. Um, let me see here. Yeah, Linda also was talking about uh, jewelry being a category that you could love and um, this got to make sure that you don't accumulate too much stuff. Um, so Miguel is saying that there are listing fees on eBay and no listing fees on eBay. The listing fee to me is negligible. It's not, it's not the reason that I would sell on Poshmark or Facebook. You should look at it traffic wise. Um, I, I, I do think though Facebook marketplace will be bigger than eBay just because it has more users. It makes sense. That's where the traffic is at. So do I think eBay is um, better than Facebook right now? Definitely, because eBay only does e-commerce. Uh, Facebook is actually in the information business. They are, they are buying and selling your data because you, you don't pay for Facebook. So I prefer paid websites because they actually value your privacy a little bit more. Um, Trading Post Ohio is saying, do you feel adding an employee would be beneficial to your business than doing it alone? It depends. Um, you're going to make the most money if you do it alone per item. Um, but you'll make more money overall if you hire someone. So when people say, 
oh, I do $10,000 in sales and, and 5,000 is profit. I think to myself, what if somebody has 10 employees and they make $6,000 profit and they don't go in the work? What's better, someone that doesn't work at all and makes $6,000 or someone that makes $5,000 busting their butt and they don't count their own time? I don't know. It depends on, on your personal profile. There's also a lot less headache when you do it by yourself. Way less headache. Um, yeah, like Scott was saying, if the platform that you're on is free, you're the product. Um, let's see. How do I feel about free shipping? I think it's a tool. Um, I think it depends on your category. In fact, that is always the answer. It depends on your category. Hey, Chris. Yeah. What, what if you do like free shipping? Because like last year I did uh, eBay, but I wasn't really hard on it. Mm -hmm. But now these last two months or this month and a half, I've been hard. So I've been doing free shipping, best offer and free returns just to move stuff mm -hmm. to get my account going. It, it depends on your category. Like some categories yeah. you can go ahead. I'm like a garage sale right now. <laughs> so so, <laughs> yeah. so this is, this is it's a good question. I would say like if you're a garage sale store, you still need to look at it one by one. Like if you're, um, yeah, let's do in a garage sale example. Let's say that you're selling a camera. You have to look at the comps and see are the people who are selling the camera charging shipping or not. You do what everybody else is doing one cent cheaper or you do what everybody else is doing better and charge more. Okay. That's how I look at it. If I was a garage sale store, I like the 600 item model. 600 items in your store you sell a really high percentage of them, 200 to 300 a month because you just make every listing amazing. Yeah, like I'm doing pretty good. Um, like yesterday was like 13. This weekend was like 30 sales. But um, I know I can only cap out like 100 and 120,000 doing this, you know? So, yeah. Um, let's see. I would say I don't mind people offering free shipping, free returns, whatever in the beginning to get that velocity moving. But I, I think that in most categories, it's okay to charge for shipping. Most categories. And I think all categories, you should offer free returns. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yep. Let's see. Um, do I follow the relisting stale inventory, Allison? I do not. I don't relist anything. I'm trying to do what Tech and Sports says and list it right the first time. So I don't delist, relist. Um, are you flipping like Facebook because the cash lands in my PayPal? That doesn't matter once you get to a certain level, how the money hits your account. Because it... Your business shouldn't be so tight that two weeks, of, two weeks of difference between getting your money in two weeks versus today, if that affects your business, you need to scale your lifestyle way down for just a couple months and then you'll have some, some money to, like as an example, I just barely got paid today for Friday's payout on eBay or whatever. That's, that's like five, four days late or later than I thought. So, um, I was telling, you know, Tech and Sports is like, it's a good day to post on Instagram because it looks like it's a really high amount. Uh, it's a good time to flex if you want to do that. But like, I'm not worried about it. If it was a month later, it would be okay too. So don't run your business based on who pays you the fastest. That's a terrible way to run which business. Um, Jack is saying a difference in traffic and sales with offering premium service. I'm not sure which premium service you're talking about. Um, Jupak is saying the top rated badge makes a difference. I don't think the top rated badge makes a difference. This is why. I don't know what that means. What does top rated mean? If, if eBay said this seller ships on time 98% of the time, that would make more sense to me as the buyer. I don't know what top rated seller means though. The badge is, I would say it's cute. It's more for like people to say I'm a top rated seller and you get a discount but I don't think that a buyer knows what it means. 
Um, yes, Scott's saying, if you charge for shipping and offer free returns, you do not have to refund original shipping. And you have the option that, to give them a partial refund up to 50%, which is amazing in case of buyer fraud. What's up, Greg? Thank you for the super chat of five bucks. Yep. I'm going to name the kid Natalie. Somebody, or um, I was worried about Braddy Natty as the nickname, but somebody said she might have the nickname Chatty Natty, which is interesting. Also, I don't know a lot about horoscope, but Aries, Aries, she's going to be an Aries. That's um, God of War or something. So I'm like, I hope that my daughter ends up being a stoic God of War. That would be interesting. Since kids don't turn out how you want anyway, it doesn't really matter what you pick. Um, Quick question. I, I believe without <clears throat> with free shipping, you could still do the 50% refund as well. Gotcha. But you do have, but you do lose the original shipping. Right. Yeah, that's right. Hey, Matt? Quick question. Yeah. You know how you can get your custom SKU on the shipping label? Yes. I understand that you can do that when you're printing one shipping label at a time. Yeah. But through, can you do that through the bulk shipping? Both of them you can. Okay. Do you know how to change that setting with bulk shipping? I do. So what you do is, uh, I'm going to show you right now. Um, okay. Hopefully you can see the screen share. So what you do is you would select, let me select two items. This is the multi print. Ship. So right here, when you, in these settings and the select doll, you, you can click this edit button and at the bottom, this is custom. So you can do gotcha. um, custom SKU, item ID, buyer ID. What I don't like is that you can't do more than one. On pirate ship, you can choose up to four of these. Can you set that as a default? Yes, it, it saves. Yeah, it saves. Awesome. So Thanks. I can't believe I never thought to hit the edit button, but appreciate it. Yeah. The edit button. That's how you, uh, save it. Um, so Christine, I think trusted seller doesn't make sense either. So what I think it should be is what Poshmark has. Poshmark says this seller ships in 1.1 days. That makes sense to me. I know what that means. You know, or when I was on Poshmark going heavy, it said this seller ships same day on average. So that, because I would, you know, I was going to say the most common question I get is when will this ship? Even though it says on the listing, right? Where, you know, literally it's one day shipping, but um, the stats are, are really nice. Um, yeah, rip, I would say everyone should run their base business based on I mean, how quickly you flip it is how easy it is to replace the item. Um, let's see. Wait, wait, how quickly you flip it is how easy it is to replace it. Yep. Is that true? I think so. Why would you wait a long time to sell Old Navy? You can get it anywhere. Or I'm like, saying if, if something flips quickly, it may might not necessarily be replenishable. I'm saying you should get all the money if you can't replace it. I got you. You know, if you're gonna sell, like, um, what is that brand that makes cast iron lodge? Is it lodge? Those are everywhere. There's no reason to sit on that. But if you had like, let's say, Le Creuset is a little bit more rare. Why not get all the money for that? Don't cheap sell that one. Actually, you know, Scott races in the, in the car right now. He buys people who cheap sell good brands. You know, that's a good model because people don't know. Um, iguana, Christine, what's Iguana? Oh, I got you. Um, Let's see. Yeah, that's interesting. So Nick is saying he'd rather sell five pairs of pants versus one and make more money in the long run. That, that's been my new mentality. But go ahead, Shaney. 
Oh, oh. I didn't have anything. I got you. So anyway, I want everyone to think of this. If you just wrote down in you on, if you just tattooed on your arm, is this less but better? You know, somebody wants to be <laughs> your friend. Is it worth it? You know, is it worth investing time into learning how to sell the next bolo that you hear on the next video after this? This is always the commercial. If you guys don't take advantage of this right now, this opportunity will be gone forever. But that's not, that means you should probably not do that because why do you want to do something that's gone forever in the short term? Why not do something that's around forever? You know, that's why I was thinking um, now because I switched to clothing, I think in my store, everyone in America could find something that they would like. At this point, there's so much stuff in it that's just common. Um, nice. Um, Daniel sold his first pair of jeans in seven hours. That's amazing. I do feel like eBay. Um, here, I'll show you guys one more thing before we take off. Everyone who's watching on YouTube, um, give me a like button. But I'm going to show you the something really interesting on eBay. Um, let's see. I'll share my screen. Okay, so if I look at my um, traffic tab, so now I'm in the 2000 range. So my goal is to have 6,000 sales per month. So I need to triple my store. So if you look at my traffic, it's almost identical. It's like a million impressions a day, almost always a million impressions a day, a million, a million, a million, a million, a million. So let me give you guys a contrast tech and sports has three times the size of the store as me, okay? His traffic, drum roll, is like 3 million a day. Mine's 1 million a day, his is 3 million a day. He has three times the size of the store as me, and he has 6,000 sales a month. So it's pretty straightforward. eBay likes to give you the same amount of traffic. There's no reason for them not to give you the traffic um, as long as you keep converting at the same pace. So I just want to keep this all the same and continue to grow. Um, but I cannot believe eBay gives you almost the same traffic every single day. And this day, um, I know why it went down. So um, the, the reason why it went down this day is because I changed my business policy. So I've changed all 11,000 of my items. So it takes some time for eBay to index. And that day it was slow. So Hopefully, uh, let's see, yesterday, I, I'm just trying, I've never had 30 days in a row all over $1,000, but I might do that if I can do it the next two days. I got, I got like on um, the day before Valentine's was really slow for me, but I was just thinking, okay, for me, a bad day is $1,000 in sales. If I can get three times the size of store, then on a bad day, my store will have $3,000 in sales. On a bad day, my store will make a million dollars a year. So I was like, wow, you can just set up your, your business to get to a certain point. Um, but anyway, eBay gives you very, very similar traffic. So don't panic. Keep growing. Um, I'm going to take off. It's time for me to go sourcing. So I'll see you guys tomorrow. Um, if you guys um, are in the Facebook group, um, Tomorrow, we have Hustle at Home Mom and Monica Posh Hanger. And Fridays, we do Amazon FBA with Jack Weaver, who does a million dollars all online arbitrage. That might be worth it for people who have trouble sourcing. He does most of his sourcing from home. 